Hey guys, I'm Logan, and I'm an Aquarius here at the Dolphin Island Estuarium. Uh, today I'm here to talk to you about corals. Uh, so currently we are in our Windows to the Sea exhibit. Uh, while our main focus here at the Estuarium is to show off the native wildlife, the Windows to the Sea opens the eyes to wildlife that you might not see around here around the coast of Alabama. And so behind me, of course, is one of our coral tanks. Um, so in this tank we have a variety of corals. Uh, so the first thing we're going to discuss is what is a coral? Um, so a coral is essentially a colonial animal. Uh, so all that means is the corals are made of hundreds to thousands of other types of animals. This type of animal that we refer to is called a polyp. Um, so polyps play an essential role in the life cycle of corals. Um, so the polyps have little tentacles and those tentacles can either be a defense mechanism and or a way for them to capture their prey in the water. Um, so these polyps extend and allows the corals to grab things in the water column that are like phytoplankton, small shrimp, small fish, things that corals might ingest uh, for their body. Now another way that corals feed is through an algae that live in the surface of their skin which also gives them their pigmentation, um, essentially their color. Uh, we refer to these guys as zooxanthellae. Uh, so these zooxanthellae are little, if you want to think of like a plant, plants photosynthesize for their food and allows them to absorb nutrients and make nutrients for the coral to grow as well. So now that we know what corals are and we know their feeding habits, let's talk about what they do. Um, so corals play quite a few vital roles in the ecosystems of the ocean. Um, even though corals make up 1% of uh, animals in the ocean, they potentially house 25% of all marine life in the water. So in this tank, guys, we have soft and hard corals. Um, so the first things are we look at our finger leather corals and our pulsing zinnia. We call these soft corals. So what these guys do, when they pass away, they don't really leave a skeleton, so that's why they are considered soft corals. You see the pulsing zinnia are opening and closing. That's their mechanism for catching stuff in the water as it drifts by. We also have our hard corals, so examples of that would be our candy canes. We got our red candy cane here. We also have a green candy cane over here. And in the back left corner of our tank, we have a bird's nest coral. So when these corals pass away, they leave a hard skeleton. Um, also known as stony skeleton. So if you think of coral reefs, a lot of the times some of the coral reefs, most of the coral reefs are made up of these hard corals and they essentially build upon. Now here in North America we have the third largest coral barrier reef and that is down in the Florida Keys. Um, here off the coast of Alabama we don't really have any uh, coral reefs per se but we do have some organisms are corals that do live here in our waters. They are not technically native and they're not technically invasive. They're kind of in our gray area. Um, they're just kind of here in their coral look at and we'll show you those guys here in a minute. So Ezra has a question. Are corals related to anything? Uh, so corals are considered an invert. Um, so like I said, they're animals. So they're more probably related to sea stars and stuff like that. Uh, Hannah wanted to know, what is the biggest corals you've ever seen? Uh, the biggest corals I've ever seen was when I was snorkeling off of the Bahamas uh, for a summer class one year. We saw some um, brain coral and it was a very large size, it was probably about three feet across in diameter. How are corals formed? Uh, so corals essentially take in ca uh, chemicals from the water like calcium, strontium, magnesium, and they use it to build their skeleton. And then the soft corals and the hard corals, are they formed differently or do they both use calcium? They both use the same chem chemicals, it's just how they absorb it and use it. So our soft corals, essentially they have polyps on top of their heads, um, they're really spongy and they soak in water and that's kind of how they blow up. Where the hard corals, they solidify it like calcium and like our bones and teeth and they just build on top of that. Um, so another type of coral that we have in here that would be considered a hard coral is our blue ridge. If you look at it, it's very bumpy kind of looking like a little mountain over here, growing like crazy. Um, Dottie wants to know, what can corals do and what are their predators? Uh, so corals, uh, they essentially their main purpose is cleaning water, provide habitat and refuge for animals. Um, some predators for corals can be crabs, uh, certain fish eat corals, especially soft corals, so you gotta be careful if you're keeping a coral tank at home yourself, um, not to introduce a fish that will tear them up and eat them. Um, other than that, another predator, if you want to consider, would be us. 
Um, we go out and we collect corals, and sometimes in the process of collecting corals for display in tanks, uh, they can be damaged. DJ asked, are corals in the river? Uh, no. However, um, if you look at the Amazon River, which we're all pretty familiar with, there is actually a coral reef in the beginning of the mouth of that river um, that was recently discovered a few years ago. Interesting. Dempsey from Tuscaloosa, he's six years old, and he wants to know, do corals have hearts? Corals do not have hearts. Um, so essentially they're all one, a, lot, a lot of organisms working together, uh, so they don't really have a lung, a heart, or anything like that. Uh, Kila, uh, Kyla, how many types of corals are there in the world? Do you happen uh, to know? I do not know. Um, I know there's probably over 3,000. Um, oh, Hannah said that's big when you talked about your brain coral. <laughs> Leah and Aubrey want to know how corals breed. Uh, so the way corals breed is kind of cool. Um, they can do it through fragmentation or budding. Um, essentially, it's where you break the coral and you start a new patch. We kind of have that going on right here with our frog spawn. You can see there's two heads now, um, where there's typically used to be one. Um, another way they do is broadcast spawning. So they'll release their uh, zygotes and stuff into the water column and mix, and then they'll settle kind of like oysters do on typically rock or sand or sometimes even bare bottom if they're in a tank, and they just grow from there. Ryland and Jacob want to know, how long do corals live? Uh, so corals can live quite a long time depending on the species. Um, I don't know the oldest coral on record, but sometimes they can be up to a thousand years old. Um, Tanya asks, why do you call them candy canes? And show me the candy canes again. So we got can the green candy cane and the red candy cane. Okay. <coughs> They're j they really just determine their name based off their coloration. Um, so when you put these guys under a blue light, they typically pop really well. Um, and so that's just where they've gotten their name from. And actually, you could do that for us. Can you put them oh. under a blue light? We'll do that real quick. So there you go. So if you can see that, Tanya, there's a little bit of a difference in the color of them. How old are these corals that we have in this tank? Uh, so the age of these guys is really unknown. They've been with us since the new exhibit has opened. Um, so probably about five years or so. Uh, Tessa, are corals only in the ocean? Mary, age 11, wants to know. They are. Um, so typically when we think of coral reefs, we associate them with warm waters. Um, so Florida, Australia, stuff like that. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, they are found in the mouth of the Amazon River. Uh, Kyla, says, Kyla says they're very pretty. Um, let's see, Piper, do they change colors? Uh, depending on the species. So once they kind of establish their color, it's kind of set. Um, but a color indication or color change can determine that a coral is stressed. Uh, so just like we get stressed, corals do as well. And they have a different way of expressing it than we do. Erica asks, what is the name of the coral that looks like circles? So I guess that would be this one. So this guy right here in front of us is called an acan. We might want to turn the light back to the light. Let's see a little bit better. There we go. So that's called a what? A-can. A-C-A-N. What do corals eat? So here at this facility, we feed these guys a variety of things. Um, occasionally, we feed them live brine shrimp, which, of course, is also known as a sea monkey. Uh, we feed mysis shrimp, which is a smaller shrimp than what you would typically eat on your dinner plate. Um, we also do frozen brine shrimp and cyclops. Cyclops look like little, uh, little monsters, kind of little wee beasties, if you want to call them that. Um, they're very small, and so they're perfect for these polyps to grab and hold and bring into their mouth. Um, and a side note, we do our we grow our own brine shrimp here, don't we? We do. It's pretty cool. Lauren H8, where is the biggest coral reef in the world? So the largest coral reef right now is the Great Barrier Reef over in Australia. Um, it's approximately 1,600 miles, and it can be seen from outer space. Very cool. Um, Cooper H5, what does a coral eat? So what are some of the different things that they can eat? And then y'all actually hand feed some corals at times, don't you? So what we do here is, uh, so we, fit, we feed what I mentioned earlier, live brine shrimp, frozen brine shrimp, mysis, and cyclops. Um, occasionally we will put it in a turkey baster and we'll blast them. Um, so we'll actually direct the food at their polyps so they don't have to work overtime. Um, because in coral reef systems, you can get some uh, unwanted guests, as we call them. Uh, we make sure that we're target feeding our corals so they're absorbing the food and using the food and the other animals or the unwanted guest is not getting the food itself. Sydney, 16 years old, wants to know what is the biggest coral we have in this tank? So can you point uh, out? So the largest coral we'll have in this tank, if you want to, size-wise, is going to be our finger 
our finger leather coral. Um, but the most abundant right now would probably be our Poulton Xenia on the right side. This guy. That's pretty cool. Um, what is the biggest... Oh, wait, we asked that. Uh, Will, six years old, wants to know how many types of coral are near Dolphin Island. So what can we see off the beach here? So if you want to walk with me over here to this other tank, I will show okay. you. So here at Dolphin Island, if you are far enough offshore, you can see these guys. Um, these guys are referred to as Tabastria, also known as sun polyps. Um, so these are the guys I was telling you about that aren't really invasive, not really native. Uh, so they're kind of in that gray area. Um, so they kind of just do their own thing out there. We typically see them around rigs, uh, the gas rigs off the coast. And so if you go down deep enough, you can find these guys. Now these guys do not photosynthesize whatsoever with that zooxanthellae. If you look at their mouths or the top of their heads, you see those polyps, which are those little tentacles hanging off, and that's how they capture their prey. Now, I threw some food in here earlier, so they're beginning to open up and wake up for breakfast, um, but you still see them. They're quite closed up. Uh, so these guys are not, usually nocturnal feeders, but we get them stimulated with food, and so they know there's food in the tank, so they're working their best to wake up to get some food. Uh, Ezra wants to know, do corals have any insides? They Essentially, they can. So when the polyps will decide that, hey, I ate and you're stressing me out, they will actually, if they've eaten something recently, they'll pretty much throw it up. Um, and you were talking about, what is breakfast or lunch or dinner for the corals as far as like timing? Uh, so we typically feed these guys once a day. Um, but I fed them this morning so that we could see them open up. Uh, so these guys, like I said, eat once a day. And this morning I gave them Artemia. Uh, Frozen, or frozen brine shrimp, also known as Artemia. Um, it was a lot larger than what we typically feed when they're alive. Um, James wants to know, are there any corals that are poisonous? Uh, so yes, there are some corals that are uh, poisonous to the touch. Um, so you gotta be careful when handling certain types. Um, the first one that comes to the top of my head we used to actually have on display here. Um, it was a Honestly, I can't remember what it was called. Well, we'll find it. We will it look it up for you. Um, Casey wants to know, do corals have a heart? They do not. Kyla, what are some of the different types of coral? So the types are hard and soft typically, um, but you can have a variety of within those different types. So like over there in our coral tank, we have the finger leathers, we have the candy canes, the acans, the duncans, um, the Poulton Xenia, the big red one in the center that kind of looks like a, a ledge is a red monty. Um, we also have a green monty over here to the right um, with mushrooms around it. So we have quite a variety of them. Are barnacles a type of corals? They are not. Um, Maddox wants to know what the most common coral is. Ooh. Um, I guess it really just depends who you ask. In the aquarium trade, uh, probably the most common type would be the Xenia. And that's the one over there here? Yep, the Poulton Xenia. There you go. Isabella wants to know if corals can camouflage. Uh, I'm not really sure. That would be a question to ask our researchers. Leah asks, how long have corals been around? Uh, corals have been around for a very long time. Um, I do not have the exact number of years off the top of my head, um, but they've probably been around since the dawn of the dinosaurs. Where do you find the most corals? Uh, so typically we find them in tropical waters. Um, so if you think uh, uh, the Florida Keys or uh, like Australia, off the coast of Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, that water is pretty tropical as well. Um, you also have them around the Bahamas. Uh, you can find them usually typically in warm waters. Uh, Ezra, is anything related to them on land that's not in the sea? Not that I'm aware of, but that would be a question to ask our researchers. So what is this guy over here that I just spotted? He didn't have green stuff coming out earlier. So that is called a green star polyp. Um, so if you look very closely, those polyps that are coming out are kind of in the shape of a star. And so when they come out and fully cover, it looks like a little, black, uh, little bed of grass. They almost look like brittle stars. Yep. Does anything live inside our coral? So do we have any guys in here with our coral? We do not have anybody in here that's living in our corals. However, in our reef tank, we do have a few hermit crabs that are crawling across the bottom. Um, they are our scavengers and our cleanup crew, so they eat the extra food that the corals do not eat for us. Um, Grace H8, how many different colors can a coral come in? 
Uh, the, again, it depends on the species, um, but typical coloration, I guess, would probably range from about four. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. So our Blue Ridge right here, um, it's a, kind of a purplish pink right now. Uh, you can find them in red and orange as well. And it's kind of interesting because they look like fingers, but you can't really tell that they have, they just look like a rock. Yep, so these guys actually feed nocturnally. And so occasionally in the early mornings or late at night when we're coming by our tank, they will have their polyps just sitting down and they look like little feathers coming off of those stalks. Um, and that's when we know they're ready to feed. Um, Nick, he has a four-year-old. Do they eat any plastic? They do eat microplastics. So that's another importance of corals. Do the microplastics damage them? Uh, so these guys have found a way to metabolize them and break them down. Um, there could be some side effects for that, but again, that would probably be a better question for our researchers. Uh, let's see. And Ezra wants to know, can fish live in them, aka hide? We don't have any fish in here, but some do use corals, don't they? Some do use corals, uh, the most notably. So if we look at our bird's nest coral up to the left, um, while it doesn't really a fish, there are some crabs that take refuge in those guys. Um, a lot of people think of anemones when they think of corals, even though they're not really related. Uh, so you got clownfish, of course, that live in anemones, and that's uh, pretty cool. Um, but occasionally clownfish will host things like xenia and duncan heads um, when they're in a coral reef tank. Uh, Mary asks, are they alive? Yes, they are. Do they have any organs? These guys do not have organs. They're, <laughs> go ahead. How do they get their shape? Uh, so their shape varies. So they kind of, most corals grow towards the light or depending how the light is. Um, if they have space to grow around them, they get bigger around um, if there's enough rock clearance. So these guys don't like to touch each other. They're very personable about their space. Um, so they typically try to avoid other things because these guys essentially uh, will fight with each other if there's not enough space to grow. And so they're trying to make sure that they can get as much space as they want. So they try to pick the ideal spot to settle. Uh, we have Brianna, Dawson, and Landon all are asking how they eat and do they have a mouth? So, so where would you call their mouth? So their mouths are typically at the polyps. So if you think of a polyp like an anemone, you have your tentacles, and then behind, beneath the tentacles is what they have a polyp or opening. And so those tentacles essentially capture the prey, and it works it down kind of like an escalator going down to the mouth, and then it digests it. Um, and once it's done digesting it, it regurgitates its leftovers. Um, can they survive out of the water? Yes, for a very short period of time. When you say short period of time, does it depend on the species? It does depend on the species, and some of them take, get a little bit more stressed out than the others when it comes down to it. Um, do corals have eyes? They do not. Cole asks, can corals bite you? They cannot bite you, but they can sting you. Do we have any of those ones that can sting you in the Gulf of Mexico? We do not. What is their prey? Uh, so prey for these guys, of course, would be certain types of crabs, also certain types of fish. Um, so some file fish love to eat corals. Um, some parrot fish also do as well. So if you've ever been, been to the Bahamas snorkeling and you've heard crunching underwater, um, they have a queen parrot fish there. And those guys love to eat corals. So you can hear that crunching going on. So it sounds like a bunch of crabs are clacking their claws together when you're underneath the water. Uh, Bailey, who's 12 years old, asks, is our reef healthy in the Gulf? Do we have a reef in the Gulf, or is it just... So the reef that we mainly have in the Gulf that we talk about is the Florida Keys. Um, it's uh, called a coral barrier reef. Um, for the most part, it is healthy. Now, it does have signs of bleaching, and we are losing parts of that reef as we speak, just like we are in the Great Barrier Reef over in Australia. Um, but when these guys bleach, sometimes they have a chance to recover as long as conditions get better. Vivian, who's nine years old, she wants to know, are there any endangered corals in the Gulf? So are there any corals that we could lose? So the two biggest species that come to mind are called staghorn and elkhorn corals. They are considered a hard coral, and they are actually protected down in the Florida Keys um, because these guys are super vulnerable right now. Uh, not only are they suffering from bleaching and destruction by boats going on reefs and sitting there and fishing, um, they also have a specialized disease that is taking them out as well. Wow. Leah wants to know how coral is pollinated. Uh, so these guys, of course, pollinate through fragmentation. Um, also budding is essentially where the coral splits apart and grows a new head. Um, these guys also uh, mass spawn, and so they release their zygotes into the water, they mix, and you have your fertilized eggs, essentially that land on the bottom. Let's see, how 
How do corals breathe? Boo, who six is asking. How they breathe? Mm -hmm. uh, so these guys essentially, um, with the water moving over them, uh, that's just enough for them. They don't really have lungs, so they don't really have to breathe. I think this guy down here is really cool. Tell me his name again. He's called a green star polyp. What time of year do coral bloom? Uh, so I guess the best time of the year would probably be spring. So we'll probably start seeing some activity between April and June. Um, Mary Helen wants to know if we can watch you feed them. I think you already fed them, but you know what? I bet we could, do you have food for them? I don't have any food currently. But I bet we can get Logan to feed them for us and we'll record it. We'll share it with them. Yep, so we can do that. Can see. Yep. Um, let's see. Can corals move to a new spot? <coughs> so use eight ones today. not typically. Once these guys settle, they typically settle. Unless you're like our pulsing zinnia, these guys like to move all over the place. Um, so they originally started over here in this corner, but if you look to our left, they're surrounding our Duncan, and they're kind of trying to take it over. And how, so how do they move? Uh, so essentially, the water column moves them. So when they decide to bud, uh, the currents, based off these little jets in the tank, will push them across, and then they'll find a spot to settle out. Um, Abe, who's 10 years old, he's asking, are there any invasive species corals? He wants to be a marine biologist. Uh, so depending on the species, they can be considered invasive. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, we have the sun coral or the tabastria here in the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, let's go back over here. Swing you by a couple of other tanks as we go see our tabastria over here. So these guys, again, are not typically found here. Um, and they would technically be considered an invasive species. However, they're not really hurting anything because they're not out competing anything here in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so these guys are kind of in that gray area, so we don't really consider them invasive or native. Um, Rihanna wants to know, what are the uses of the tentacles? So I guess the tentacles you would call So the tentacles are what we call the polyps. That is where they capture their prey, and they can also use it for defenses. Um, so they can sting other corals if they entroach on their territory and stuff like that. Audrey's asking, are corals smart? Not really. <laughs> if I'm honest, sometimes they get stressed out over the smallest things. Um, so if the water quality is not right or the temperature is not right, they will let you know that, hey, I'm not happy about this. Interesting. What is your favorite coral? Kyla wants to know. My favorite coral would probably be the frog spawn coral that we have over in our coral tank. And let's go back over and see him. And while we do that, um, Esther is asking, can corals get sick? Yes, they can get sick. So these guys develop certain diseases, um, and that's part of my job here is to make sure that we keep our corals nice and healthy. Uh, if the conditions are really stressful again, um, that's a cause for them to get sick. So our frog swans are these guys. We got two of them right here. They're this looking is your favorite. Yeah, those guys are my favorite. What makes them your favorite? Just the way they look. So they're nice, big, and bubbly. Um, they're also pretty healthy and happy most of the time, uh, so they don't give me any sass. Are they, are they soft corals or hard corals? These guys are a soft coral, um, so they kind of look like anemones in a way. Very cool. Let's see. Um, do corals make noises? No, they do not. We've got a lot of questions that we've answered. Um, let's see. All right, Esther, 10 years old. We're gonna have a uh, last question here. How long does it take for a coral to form? It can be a matter of days. I think we've pretty much hit everybody's questions. Uh, Logan will jump back in and see um, if there's anything that we weren't able to answer. Um, Oh, we'll have Robert's question. He's right at the bottom. Is there a place where we are helping repopulate corals on the coast of Alabama and Florida? So can you repopulate them? We can repopulate. So the biggest way that we can repopulate corals that are affected by bleaching is through a process known as fragging. Um, we typically do that in an aquaculture facility, which of course aquaculture uh, grows food for fish, uh, fish for food consumption as well as corals to be transplanted back in the wild. Um, so there's a lot of coral farms actually around the world. Um, here in Alabama, we do not currently have one. However, I believe there are a few off in Florida. Um, the one that comes to mind first off is actually in the Bahamas. 
It's called Coral Vita. Um, those guys out there are doing a really good work at reestablishing populations around the Bahamian Islands. Wonderful. Well, Logan, thank you so much for taking time. Um, and like I said, if we have any questions that we weren't able to answer or get to, um, we will have Logan hop in. And then also, we'll fulfill the request of having you feed some of them for him. All right, guys. Have a good day.